Hey everybody, Jeffrey Scott here. Uh, thanks for checking back in with me. Today I wanted to launch part two of our exosome series and I want to talk about the biogenesis of the exosome. How does it become an exosome? And importantly, I want to shed some insight into how specific proteins, very specific nucleic acids, are targeted, sequestered, and loaded into these exosomes. It's a very complicated process, um, and I'm going to take it at about a 30,000 foot level and introduce some new concepts to you in this short presentation. So um, I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you back here when it's over. All right, I just wanted to um, start this presentation off by just giving you a overview again of the exosome biogenesis process um, and this is the best diagram the simplest diagram I could uh, truly find that really delineates this quite well if you look at the um, the top left corner here uh, there's an invagination of the plasma membrane and um, what this does is it encapsulates, it's basically taking a big gulp of the extracellular fluid as it invaginates inward um, into the cytosol. And what happens is that bud matures and it becomes what they call an early endosome. So along that early endosome, along that plasma membrane of the early endosome, you know, you're going to have um, a number of membrane brown, uh, bound proteins and you're also going to have uh, proteins that are representative of both the cytosol and the extracellular fluid um, uh, within the lumen of that early endosome. So now, once the early endosome has formed, you start to get a series of many invaginations of that early endosomal membrane. Um, and those are mediated by a number of different processes, a number of different um, uh, actions, a number of different protein complexes to form what they call intraluminal vesicles. And these intraluminal vesicles will ultimately become what we know exosomes when they are released into the extracellular space. Um, once the endosome matures, it's termed a multivesicular body and it becomes transported to the plasma membrane where it fuses and releases its cargo. In this case, the intraluminal vesicles that were in the late uh, endosome or the multivesicular body that we refer to as exosomes. The messaging for how the multivesicular body um, is determined to go to the plasma membrane and fuse or be degraded, there's a secondary pathway uh, or destination for that late endosome, and that is to fuse with a lysosome, which is a highly corrosive, caustic organelle that degrades proteins, degrades nucleic acids. It's a useful way for the cell to eliminate components it does not need. It's a waste receptacle uh, in many respects. So. That's an initial overview of the biogenesis of the exosome. Now, if you look at the anatomy of the exosome itself, it's very complicated. It's very heterogeneous. I think it's easy to think of an exosome as something that's a lipid sac that's containing a bunch of proteins and nucleic acids that uh, uh, communicate with distant cells. It is that to a degree, but you can see on this particular slide, in the plasma membrane of the exosome, uh, or in the membrane, the phospholipid bilayer of the exosome, are numerous families of transmembrane proteins. The tetraspanins, for example, are extremely important uh, in cargo selection and loading of that exosome with specific proteins that that cell wants to sell, uh, send out. You've got uh, glycoproteins here, um, 
towards the bottom of the screen, which are really important for docking and attachment uh, to recipient cells. You've got lipids. Uh, you've got these are called lipid rafts, cholesterol ceramides, sphingomyelins that change the fluidity of that particular region. And then inside, of course, you know, you do have some of the things we've already discussed in, in in, in previous presentations, you know, you've got your growth factors and cytokines and um, you know, your immune modulators, your chemokines, you certainly have those. You've got uh, quite a bit of nucleic acid, um, RNA, ribonucleic acid. You've got messenger RNA, you've got microRNA, which is a regulatory peptide, or I'm sorry, regulatory uh, nucleic acid. And you've got some other non-coding uh, RNAs as well. You've got heat shock proteins, which are stress proteins, cytoskeletal components, which you know can facilitate budding and uh, uh, endocytosis when the exosome reaches its uh, its target cell. And then something that's very important, and it's written in green here, is the ESCRT machinery. Um, I call it the S-CART system. I believe that's the proper nomenclature. It is a mechanism. It's highly complex. It's a mechanism to load exosomes uh, with particular proteins that that particular cell wants to send out. Uh, it makes sure that the proper messages, or at least most of them, are uh, getting into the um, lumen of that exosome so that um, those messages can be carried to distant cells. So that's what I want to talk about here um, is the SCART dependent mechanism. You can see here um, SCART consists of SCART 0, 1, 2, 3, um, highly complicated proteins, and then you've got a couple trigger proteins, I call them Alex and Centenins, um, that are responsible for the necessary conformational changes to drop the cargo across the phospholipid bilayer and into the lumen of the exosome itself. So how does the SCART machinery know what proteins to engage with and what proteins to leave behind? Well, the proteins the cell wants to get inside the exosome are tagged with a small molecule, small molecule called ubiquitin. And these ubiquinated proteins are able to dock with that escort complex, and there's activation of that Alex protein that shuttles that ubiquinated protein across the phospholipid bilayer of the exosome and into the lumen of the exosome. So that's one active mechanism. Um, in how the exosome gets loaded with very specific cargo. You can also see in this slide the tetraspanins. The tetraspanins um, are not related to the SCART system, but they do that they have a similar function in shuttling key proteins that the cell wants in those exosomes across that phospholipid bilayer into the lumen of that exosome. Now there are also um, as you saw in, in, in some of the earlier slides, there are a lot of proteins that are on the surface of that early endosome and ultimately become on the surface of, um, of the exosome. And one structure that you'll see throughout are called rafts. And these are ceramides, they're cholesterol, they're sphingomyelins. They change the fluidity of the phospholipid bilayer in local areas such that proteins are able to find a little home and bind to the surface. So this is what I call or what the uh, literature refers to as an SCART independent mechanism of loading an exosome. And, and these proteins ultimately become tagged to the surface, but as further invagination um, as you can imagine, on a plasma membrane, you're going to have multiple, many multiple of these RAF regions with proteins attached. And as those early endosomes form, you know, you're going to have multiple of these RAFs with proteins attached into that endosomal membrane and then continued internal uh, budding uh, as they form into a late endosome. You're going to capture those proteins on the surface of the exosome. Um, so again, that's an SCART independent mechanism. And this last slide I'm going to show today is just kind of a general overview of the process. Um, you know, you can see, you know, the late 
uh, well, here's your early endosome. It's maturing. Okay, you're getting budding uh, into the endosome, and it's becoming a multivesicle, multivesicular body. Again, these components here are called intraluminal vesicles, which ultimately will become um, exosomes as they're released. Um, and you can see here as well that um, these multivesicular bodies also have an outcome of connecting and fusing with a lysosome and there's a dedicated pathway for that to happen to uh, to degrade those contents and this is getting a little ahead of ourselves maybe this is something we'll study next time but once these exosomes are released and they find their target cell uh, there's several mechanisms uh, upon how they can exert their downstream effects uh, actively with endocytosis where the recipient cell is internalizing these exosomes. You can have direct fusion with the plasma membrane and you can also have receptor signaling uh, that can initiate a cascade of events to uh, trigger the behavior or affect the behavior um, and, and ultimately maybe the phenotype of that particular cell. I hope that video was somewhat helpful for all of you. Again, it's much more complicated than I laid it out to be, and I can't pretend to know every single in and out. But for those of you, if you geek out on cell biology and biochemistry and um, tissue health like I do, um, I really find this stuff super interesting, and I'm so happy that um, you know I can bring that to you, and hopefully it spurs some interest. Now, we will continue moving forward in the, with the topic of exosomes, uh, next week and we'll probably study um, areas of how recipient cells interact with exosomes uh, that are targeting them and find uh, elucidate the pathways that they're internalized and how they can uh, affect change in a recipient cell so in the meantime follow us here at YouTube follow me on Facebook the link is in the description and check out my website stayregenerative.com Join my mailing list for access to additional material, um, as well as just kind of general updates on the markets, as well as uh, what we're doing here at StayRegenerative.com. Until then, my friends, stay regenerative.